Yeah, it's been a fascinating contest, hasn't it? The SNP, with that famous reputation for being rock-solid and ultra-disciplined, have, uh, well, uh, they've had a bit of a wobble, haven't they, to say the least. We're about to find out the direction the party and the country takes from here. Either way, there's going to be a lot to talk about. You, no doubt, will have your thoughts and opinions too. Do share them with us throughout the programme. If you want to do that, just use the hashtag BBC Sunday Show on social media. So to the candidates. Humza Youssef, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan have been through a relentless series of hustings, debates and interviews just to get this far. It is almost over. The polls close at midday tomorrow. And a couple of hours after that, the SNP will have its new leader. Come Tuesday, the Scottish Parliament will vote and unless there's some massive upset, that person will become our next First Minister. They'll be sworn in officially on Wednesday. In the recent history of the SNP, these events have been a bit of a formality, but not this one. The past six weeks have been a right old rumpus, haven't they? So what of the wider independence movement? What impact, if any, has the contest had on the cause? Well, the broadcaster, columnist and author Leslie Riddick is perhaps better plugged in than anyone to the grassroots independence movement, and I'm pleased to say she joins me now. Morning, Leslie. Morning. Uh, thanks for being with us. So, that question, what impact has this had on the movement? What's the mood in the movement now after the past six weeks? Well, it, it, you know, it, it has been pretty fractious and upsetting, but actually there is, I think for probably everyone, a sense of relief that we're about to get a result, an expectation of a reset that has actually been long overdue, and um, I hope that there's a kind of refreshing, because there hasn't been a huge connection really between the SNP leadership and the wider Yes movement. So already there's a, an, an attempt to set up a, a kind of coordinating yes movement in the wake of this. So it's been a bit of a, you know, a bit of a kind of kick up the backside to everybody because the idea that the SNP can, can be left alone to determine the direction of independence with the ups and downs that necessarily accompany an electoral cycle and personalities that change has sort of shown people that really there has to be some uh, other act um, grouping in, in, in this game. So, so while it may have dented the party, for now at least, you, you're saying it hasn't necessarily dented the cause? I don't think so, but, uh, you know, we'd, we'd wait to see because it, it, does, it does depress people. I think the thing is that over devolution, and particularly the last years the SNP's been in charge, there's been an expectation amongst the public generally that Scotland does better than the UK average at things. And when that has proved not to be the case, it depresses people. Um, so that this situation at the moment is depressing, but there will be a new start. The uh, polls indicate that there hasn't been a massive shift away from independence. The opposition parties haven't managed to capitalise massively yet. And so there's still a lot to go for. Was it a failure of leadership, do you think, not to have a more rigid and more choreographed succession plan? I mean, it, it's not like Nicola Sturgeon, that, is it? Well, uh, as I was thinking about this, I'm sure if there was something a lot more rigid and a, and a successor absolutely punted on people, um, there would have been massive criticism about that too, because actually the bigger criticism of Nicola was that under her leadership and Peter Murrell's steership of the uh, SNP, things were terribly orchestrated and tr tremendously controlled. So um, maybe there was no way other than doing this. Um, I know there's a lot talked about succession planning, but there was a unique piece of succession planning between Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon that took years, actually. Um, no one seems to remember Nicola was on the verge of losing back in 2003 when Alex swung back into politics. So there was always going to be a little bit of a cliff face. It's more, I think, that there are a lot of unresolved policy issues beneath everything. Is the SNP progressive? Is it social democratic? What's its economic strategy? The other nations are beginning to pick up ahead of us now. Wales has got a national energy company. Northern Ireland, when it gets its DUP problems sorted, will have the best of all worlds in trading. And what's Scotland got? We need to really be pushing for a better deal within devolution and an independent strategy. And those are the bits that have been really riling people. Well, the direction we take, certainly on, on a lot of policy, will depend very much on who comes out of the winner in this process tomorrow. Let's look at the candidates, if I may. Um, how does a Kate Forbes government work? There's been all this talk that, that senior figures, would, she'd struggle to fill a cabinet with senior politicians. I mean, are you buying that? I don't know, because we've had this in the past that people have said strong things and have then found themselves able to sit in cabinets. There are obviously quite a lot of people within a government, so it's quite possible to fill those posts. 
Uh, there would also have to be the positions of advisors filled because I'm imagining she would pretty much clear out everything that exists already. There's a chief executive's position that has to be filled. You know, there's a lot of new stuff that has to be filled. The bigger question, which you'll be coming on to, is whether or not any of that is done with the backing of the Greens. And um, looking back at Alex Salmond, who uh, first government was a minority government, uh, he did have an agreement with the Greens, at least, that allowed certain key votes to rely on their support. It's possible with the degree of acrimony there's been over the last couple of days that that's not present, and that makes life more tough. Does the, does the party fracture, can there be a truce, is what I'm asking, between Kate Forbes and the, the so-called progressive wing of the party itself, or do they hemorrhage more members and more support if she comes in, given what she's said in the, in the past six weeks? It, it's difficult to know because, I mean, if she wins, she's won that argument, or at least, perhaps, she's won the argument that a bold-looking uh, leader who clearly isn't scared to walk right up to one of her colleagues and basically diss him right to his face. I mean, if she scares anybody else, I think people think, turn her around and point her at the Tories, she'll scare them. And that might well be the, the uh, drive behind Kate's campaign. People are prepared to look the other way a little bit on some of the economic issues. Or it might be that that is precisely what people like about Kate. But if she wins, she's won something. And if, yes, I'm not in a political party, but whoever has decided to join will have to make their peace with that fact that she has won something. It won't stop everyone arguing for different policies. An SNP conference is vital in this because it's been, it's been overlooked in the past. It's voted one way, the leadership's gone the other way. That has to be reset, and people will be looking to see how the internal democracy of the SNP changes ASAP under a new leader. Yeah, you touched on this just a second ago. I'm, I'm, I'm about to speak to Anna Sarwar. How much do you think Labour could gain from all this, if anything? I mean, does, does the SNP's misfortune necessarily favour the Labour Party? Well, it looks, you know, it's, it's difficult to know. Um, there's obviously a lot of people within the SNP who were Labour voters, you know, in the past. Uh, they would be looking to see some really progressive stuff from Labour. And unfortunately for Anna Sarwar, I think, he is in a don't rock the boat mode with Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer's policies, for a Scottish perspective, are so sort of blue tinted. They're so close to conservative policy that it's hard to see anything that really gets you excited. So Anna Sarwar needs to be trying to excite a Scottish electorate that expects a lot more, and I don't know if he's got the room to do it. The other thing, obviously, people coming over from the SNP support independence. So the group within Labour that already is pro indy or at least pro uh, an Indy ref, that group's going to get larger. So it will be, you know, it'll be something to manage. Well, we shall ask him how he's going to manage it in just a second. In the meantime, Leslie Ritter, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning.